you very much, Barry Kitty, worth paying attention <laughs> to Chandaria. Um, I will also give you a quick overview of the story so far, just augmenting Barry's. So at the broadest level, my question is, what is it about the human mind that allows us to lead such peculiar lives, um, to depend so profoundly on cooperation for survival, to have so radically transformed our environments, and to live lives which are embedded in technology, agriculture, science, religion, politics, trade, law, history, art, music, sports. All of these things, uniquely human aspects of our lives. <coughs> and the answer that I'm offering is that we are able to lead these peculiar lives because we, unlike all other animals, have cognitive gadgets. That is, special purpose cognitive mechanisms which have been shaped not by genetic evolution. Um, they are not cognitive instincts. Instead, they have been shaped by cultural evolution. I'm suggesting that they are analogous to simple pieces of technology like spinning wheels, traps, bows and arrows, canoes. These simple pieces of technology are obviously not products of genetic evolution, but nor are they products of a design council, one or a collective of humans sitting down and working out what features this piece of technology should have in order to do a certain job. They're not a product of intentional design either. Instead, they're products of cultural evolution. And I'm suggesting that cognitive mechanisms like theory of mind, like causal reasoning, um, episodic memory, are similar in that insofar as they do their jobs well, it's because they've been shaped by cultural evolution and they are put together in the course of childhood development from old parts. And as Barry mentioned, I talked last time about some of those old parts from which they're put together. So I suggested that the uh, mind-relevant genes of humans are not identical to the mind-relevant genes of chimpanzees, there are quantitative differences. That is, genetic evolution has made us more socially tolerant, less aggressive, more socially motivated. We want social rewards more than other animals, including our recent ancestors in the primate line. Also, we have attentional biases which make us attentive to faces and voices from birth. And we have souped up multi-purpose or domain general cognitive mechanisms, working memory, inhibitory control, and associative learning. And from that foundation of quantitative changes that genetic evolution has made to us, then these special purpose cognitive mechanisms are built in the course of an individual's development through social interaction. So I introduced the question and the answer and these proposals about what really is in our genes that contributes to our peculiar lives. And I also admitted that I'm neither fish nor fowl, certainly not a pure philosopher, high flying, nor a deep sea empirical scientist. All the work which is reported in these lectures is somewhere in the hybrid region between those two. And in this lecture, I want to dip down a bit towards the empirical science and look at these two case studies, imitation and mind reading, or also known as theory of mind. So when you see the word imitation, I wonder what you think of, you may well think, of something like that. Because in day-to-day -day usage, we use the term imitation to refer to copying of all kinds of things. Copying the way that somebody else dresses, um, copying what they choose to eat, 
copying where they go to get their hair cut. All of those things will be called imitation. But in cognitive science, imitation is reserved for a very specific kind of copying, um, sometimes known as topographic copying. That is copying the way in which the parts of the body move relative to one another. So this little boy is imitating the men ahead of him because he has his arms together and behind his back. The parts of his body are configured in the same way as the corresponding parts of the men's body. That's why he's said to be imitating. Now, this kind of copying has been a focus because it's thought to have been very important in our ancestors in learning how to make and to use tools, something which promoted our very peculiar lives. It's also important in rituals, very often involving dance. Think, how do you know how to move your body in a dance? You learn by imitation. Dancing and other ritualistic movements are perhaps surprisingly important in promoting bonding within the members of a group and thereby enhancing cooperation between the members of the group. And remember, humans are hyper-cooperative relative to other animals. Imitation is also important in our learning of gestures, incidental gestures, how the members of a particular social group hold their head or how they move their head to indicate that they're curious. These kinds of small gestures, you may not even be aware that you are performing them, let alone aware that you're learning them by imitation, act as shibboleths which distinguish in-group members from out-group members and therefore define the <coughs> limits of cooperation. So this kind of imitation, this copying of body movement configuration has played a very important part in the emergence of our peculiar lives. That's one of the reasons why this kind of copying is being singled out. The other reason is because it's surprisingly difficult to explain how we do it. It's not hard to think of a psychological mechanism which would allow us to copy somebody's choice of clothes or choice of food or which door to go through. It is hard to imagine a mechanism which will enable us to copy configurations of body movements. Because if you think about what this little boy can see as he copies the men, all he can see is the pavement in front of him. When he does the same thing as they are doing from our third party perspective, it doesn't look at all the same to him. Arms behind back looks to him like pavement. There isn't a visual match between the two. So how is his cognitive system mapping, to use a lovely phrase, the seen but unfelt onto the felt but unseen? Now that lovely phrase comes from Andrew Meltzoff, who is a towering figure in the study of imitation, and has been since 1977, when his work did not and has not subsequently addressed the question of how does the mechanism do it, but nonetheless his work produced striking evidence that whatever the mechanism is which enables us to copy configural body movements, it is in the genes. Because this study, now 40 years old, apparently showed that newborn infants, sometimes less than an hour old, were capable of imitating a range of facial expression, including tongue protrusion, mouth opening, and lip protrusion. And it was very important that there was a range of actions that the newborns could imitate, because if it was just one thing, say, tongue protrusion, then it could just be an inborn reflex, not the kind of mechanism which is going to enable the child to copy a range of body movements, including hands behind back, so this very striking result led um, Andrew Meltzoff to suggest that we are homo imitans. This is so important to our development, our capacity to imitate. 
um, that it defines us, homo imitans, that it's a genetically evolved capacity, whatever the mechanism is, it's genetically evolved and it's present at birth. Now, that has been the dominant view of imitation, that it's a cognitive instinct. Um, since the early 1970s, since 15 years before Stephen Pinker even produced the term cognitive instinct, and it's been tremendously influential in developmental psychology, laying the foundations for the idea of core cognition, the cognitive foundations which are in the genes. But it has always suffered controversy because there seemed to be a lot of difficulty in replicating the result. Now, Elizabeth Ray and I, in 2011, reviewed all the studies of newborn facial gesture imitation which had been done up to that point. And this is what we found. These are the gestures that had been tested. And this is the number of published experiments reporting positive results and the number reporting negative results, that they could not find evidence of newborn imitation. And as you can see, the number of positive reports outnumbers negative reports only for tongue protrusion, not for any other action. But it's tremendously difficult to do research with newborn babies. So it was always possible, plausibly, to argue that the studies which had got negative results had got the methods wrong or tested too few infants. But the uncertainty was removed last year, I think, by a study done in Brisbane by Virginia Slaughter's group, in which they used exactly the same cross-target method of testing as Meltzoff and Moore had used. And the study had unprecedented power they tested more than 100 babies. That's five to 10 times as many babies in a single study as had ever been done before. And what they did was to, for each baby, show it a number of different um, actions, uh, nine of them, and measure the frequency with which the baby performed the action that it had just seen relative to all the other actions in the set. And what they found was that in the case of tongue protrusion, that shows the frequency of tongue protrusion after the baby had just watched tongue protrusion, relative to the frequency of all the other actions in the set just after the baby had watched tongue protrusion. So that's the predicted result for imitation. But that predicted result only occurred for tongue protrusion. It didn't occur for any of the other actions in the set. Now this was the pillar on which the claim that imitation is a cognitive instinct rested. And I think this study shows that that pillar was not sound. So what's the alternative? What's the cognitive gadget account of imitation? Well, it aims not only to say where imitation comes from, but how the mechanism works, how the uh, seen but unfelt, what the other person is doing, gets converted into the felt but unseen, what I'm doing. And what this cognitive gadget count suggests is that what is inborn are two sequence learning processes, perceptual sequence learning and motor sequence learning. So perceptual sequence learning is the kind of learning that goes into operation if you're watching a series of people or a series of vehicles go past on the street. It's how you would learn the serial order in which the people or the vehicles passed, or the order of events that precede um, a hunted animal emerging into the open. That's perceptual sequence learning. Motor sequence learning is the kind of learning which enables you to learn to ride a bike or to throw a spear. It's learning the serial order of body movement or action components. Now, we are far from being the only animals who are capable of these forms of sequence learning. We may well be better at perceptual sequence learning than any other animal, um, but certainly these two, these are domain general processes, 
They operate on a variety of different perceptual inputs, and they are present in a broad range of animals. And in us and in other animals, they are closely related with one another. So we use what we know about the sequence of events in the world to guide our body movements, and we use our knowledge of body movement sequences to anticipate what we will see in the world. But uniquely in humans, these two processes have become very intimately and distinctively connected to one another by what we call matching vertical associations. That sensory representations of actions, what an action looks like when performed by somebody else, has got linked up with motor representations of the same actions. These two have got connected by bidirectional excitatory links when one of them is activated, the other one will be activated in both directions. So, in effect, perceptual sequence learning has become geared to motor sequence learning by these matching vertical associations. And where do they come from? From sociocultural experience. The most obvious source for something like hand movements is watching your own hand movements. So if you watch your own hand movements, simultaneously you have a sensory visual representation of the action being activated by the sight of it, but also a motor representation has to be activated in order to perform it. So you're getting correlated activation of these two, which produces an excitatory association between them. How social is that? Minimally social, but think about cultures in which swaddling is the norm in infancy. There's much less opportunity for <coughs> observation of hand movements there. So even sociocultural factors modulate even self-observation. But self-observation isn't going to produce these vertical associations for actions like arms behind back or for facial expressions. Because what you see when you do them is not the same as what you see when you observe somebody else doing them. For those kinds of actions, you can only form one of these vertical associations through intensively social experience. So, for example, being imitated by an adult when you're in infancy. The adult's action enables you to see the action that you are performing as you perform it. Optical mirrors, of course, do the same thing. and Synchronous action in the course of sports and dance and drills again gives you the opportunity simultaneously in a correlated or contingent way to see and do the same action. The kind of experience that produces these matching vertical associations. And once this gadget is in place, the new gadget is the geared together version of the two old parts, perceptual sequence learning and motor sequence learning, connected by these vertical associations formed through social interaction. Once you've got the new gadget, you can learn a new motor skill, a new sequence of movements, without doing it, just by watching it. So that's the gadget theory. Um, what's the evidence of gadgetry? I'll just try to give you a flavor of the evidence um, with one study from adults, one from infants, and one from non-human animals. The adults, I'll just remind you, those who were here from the first lecture, that I mentioned a study showing that in adult humans, imitative capacity, imitative ability, as measured by the functioning of the mirror neuron system, is highly plastic and it is modified by exactly the kind of correlated sensory motor experience that the gadget theory says it should be. Supporting that is this study of infants, which was led by Corinna de Klerk. And what she did was to take um, babies of seven to nine months of age before they were able to walk 
and suspended them on a harness over a treadmill so that the treadmill made them perform walking movements with their legs. And while they were thus suspended over the treadmill, she set up in front of them a screen and they were encouraged to look at the screen which was showing their own leg movements in real time. So the babies had the opportunity for correlated experience of seeing and doing walking movements. Now, of course, some of the babies were more attentive to the screen than others were. So some of them experienced a stronger correlation between seeing and doing the walking movements than others. And what she found by making electrical recordings from the scalp was that the babies who had experienced the strong correlation between seeing and doing showed a stronger mirroring or imitative neural response. They showed more sensory motor alpha suppression over central electrodes, the kind of suppression which occurs when an individual is performing stepping movements, and they showed this suppression when they were merely watching stepping movements. So, absolutely consistent with the cognitive gadget theory. Now, budgies may surprise you in this context, but remember, if a theory is saying, look, associative learning is at the root of the capacity for imitation. Associative learning is something which is found in all vertebrate and a wide range of invertebrate species. So, it should be possible for humble animals to have a limited capacity for imitation. Specifically, they should be able to imitate actions which, in the course of their ordinary lives, they have the opportunity to see and do in a correlated way. And budgerigars have the opportunity to see and do simultaneously uh, pecking movements and stepping movements, movements of their feet. So in this experiment, we showed budgerigars on their own laptop video of either stepping or pecking movements. Oh. I can't find the um, cursor. Ah, just found that moment. Thank you, Richard. So this is what the um, subject budgerigar saw in the pecking condition. They saw the budgie pushing out the stopper so that he could get some seed underneath. And another group of budgerigars saw the model or demonstrator using his foot to push the stopper out of the way to get at the seed. We then allowed the um, observer budgerigars to access the stopper in the seed box for the first time, either immediately after watching that footage or 24 hours later. And we found in both cases that budgies which had observed stepping did more stepping than pecking, and budgies that had observed pecking did more pecking than stepping. <coughs> that was true, notice immediately and 24 hours later, that's deferred imitation, which since the time of Piaget has been seen as a very high cognitive achievement but present in dumb animals, budgerigars, very distantly related from humans, as one would expect on the cognitive gadget theory because they are capable of associative learning and they have the correlated experience necessary for these particular actions. So I've given you a flavor of the evidence. There is the cognitive gadget account of the origins of imitation a mechanism put together from all parts, in the human case, through social interaction. Now, let's turn to the other case study, mind reading, which is also known as um, theory of mind, or mentalizing. And we'll run through the same steps. What is it? Why is it considered important? Why is it thought to be a cognitive instinct? Uh, what is it? It's not telepathy. Um, it's the ascription of mental states, thoughts and feelings, beliefs and desires to oneself and to others, 
typically with the function of predicting behavior. So this man is mind reading uh, in that he is thinking that the little girl believes that the cat loves her. So that would be a third order um, intentional ascription. He thinks that she thinks that the cat loves her. Why is it important? Well, it enables us to compete and to cooperate with one another. In the cooperation case, it plays a crucial role in the pragmatics of language, working out what it is that other people's utterances mean, and also in the teaching. The teaching of many skills could be achieved if the teacher merely focused on what the pupil could do, but an awful lot of teaching is going to be enhanced by the teacher focusing on what the pupil knows and does not know, in other words, using mind reading. And why is it thought to be in the genes? Now, this is a very different case from the imitation case. Essentially, there was this one foundation of the view that imitation was a cognitive instinct, whereas there is apparently a number of reasons why reasonable people think that theory of mind is, or theory of mind or mind reading is a cognitive instinct. But in this article a couple of years ago, Chris Frith and I argued that if you compare mind reading with print reading or literacy, then most of that putative evidence that mind reading is a cognitive instinct ceases to look nearly as compelling. Let me just give you a couple of examples relating to neural specialization and genetic disorders. So it's well known that there is neural specialization for mind reading. There are areas, for example, the temporal parietal junction, which are more active when we are um, ascribing thoughts and feelings to others than when we are thinking about other kinds of hidden cause. It's tempting to think that neural specialization or localization like that indicates that the genes put it there, okay, that the faculty in question is a cognitive instinct. But that temptation, I think, can be resisted if one reflects on the fact that print reading or literacy is also neurally specialized. For example, there's an area of occipitotemporal cortex which is so reliably active in literate people when they are looking at printed words that it's known as the visual word form area. But of course, we know that print reading, the cognitive mechanisms involved in literacy, are not cognitive instincts. There has only been, print has only been around for five to 6,000 years, not enough time for genetic evolution to give us specialized mechanisms for print reading. So the fact that mind reading shows neural localization does not give us reason to believe that it's a product of genetic evolution, that it's a cognitive instinct. Similarly, genetic disorders, uh, it's well known that many people with autism spectrum conditions have a very specific difficulty in ascribing thoughts and feelings to themselves and others. Uh, even when their language skills and their IQ are comparable with other people without autism spectrum conditions, they have particular difficulty in mind reading. And there is a significant genetic component in the etiology of autism. But again, reflection on the case of print reading suggests that this is not itself evidence for seeing mind reading as a cognitive instinct because there are dyslexias, uh, <coughs> selective difficulties in learning to read print in which there is again a significant genetic component in their etiology but we know that print reading is not a cognitive instinct. So that kind of consideration opens the way 
for a gadget account of the origins of mind reading, as does this um, behavioral genetics study, a twin study done in 2005 by Claire Hughes and her colleagues. So this group took more than a thousand twins, identical twins and uh, non-identical fraternal twins, and tested their mind reading ability at the age of five, and found that the identical twins, now recall that identical twins have all of their genes in common, and fraternal twins have on average 50% of their genes in common, found that the identical twins were no more alike in their mind reading ability than were the fraternal twins. There was a correlation of 0.53 in both cases. So they concluded that there's a substantial shared environmental influence, but negligible genetic influence on individual differences in theory of mind. So those data open the way for the view that whatever are the computations which underlie mind reading, and still relatively little is known about those computations, but whatever they are, like the computations underlying print reading, they are assembled in the course of development through social interaction. And let me give you just a sample of the evidence. Oh, ah, I've got the, the slides in the wrong order. Sample of the positive evidence for that view of mind reading. Much of it comes from studies of children. And what it suggests is that we are taught to read minds the way that we're taught to read print. For example, another study from Virginia Slaughter's group, and this study, um, three-year-old children were observed with a picture book in interaction with their mothers while the pair were looking at a picture book. And what the study showed was that the subsequent development of mind reading was predicted not just by how often the mother used mental state terms in this conversation over the picture book, but how often the mother used causal explanatory statements in effect, instructions about the relationship between situations and mental states, mental states and facial expressions and actions, and the interaction among mental states. So statements like, he's smiling because he's happy, he's happy because he got to play with the dog, um, he does not know because he did not see, all of these direct statements about how the mind works. It was how often the mother used those kinds of statements that predicted how well the child subsequently developed mind reading. So that's analogous to when we instruct children on grapheme, phoneme, correspondence rules. This set of letters sounds like ing. That it's direct teaching or instruction. But also, there's evidence that scaffolding or epistemic engineering of the child's environment facilitates the development of mind reading. In this example, Tomoko and Ruffman followed children from 15 months to 24 to 31. And when they observed them in conversation with their mothers at 15 months, or when their mothers were talking to them at 15 months, they found that mothers used desire emotion terms much more often than thinking knowledge terms. And it was how often the mother used the desire emotion terms of 15 months that predicted the children's mind reading ability at 24 months. At 24 months, the mothers were using many more belief, knowledge, thought terms than desire emotion terms and it was the frequency with which the mothers used those knowledge, thought terms that predicted how good the children were at mind reading at 31 months. So what this implies was that 
the mothers were facilitating the development of mind reading by presenting easy mental states in conversation before hard mental states. Desires and emotions are easier for children to understand because they're very often trying to fulfill their desires and because emotions often have one distinctive visual expression. So it's easier to learn about them than it is to learn about beliefs and knowledge. Correspondingly, mothers are exposing their children to the easy mental states, like easy words, before the hard mental states, like hard words. And one other example, in the world order, there we are, of um, evidence in favor of the cognitive gadget theory of mind reading comes from uh, an intriguing sort of natural experiment, which was the emergence in the 1970s of a new sign language among deaf people in Nicaragua. This is the sign for Nicaragua in Nicaraguan sign language. And Pires and Zengas, um, in the early 2000s, studied two groups of people using Nicaraguan sign language. There was the first cohort, uh, they were people who'd learned Nicaraguan Sign Language when it was relatively rudimentary, when there were, for example, very few signs for mental states. And they studied a second cohort who had learned Nicaraguan Sign Language 10 years later, when it was much richer and included many more terms for mental states. And what they found when they tested these two groups in 2001 was that, sure enough, the first cohort had very few signs for mental states relative to the second cohort, and also that the first cohort had much less developed mind-reading skills as measured by a task in understanding false beliefs than the second cohort. Interestingly, when they retested the two groups two years later, when the first cohort had had an opportunity to catch up, to learn the mental state terms, which had been subsequently developed. They found that sure enough, the first cohort had more mental state verbs at their command, and also, correspondingly, they were better able to think about false belief. So this, I think, is very interesting in part because of the age difference between these two cohorts. The members of the second cohort were, on average, 10 years younger. They were all adults, but they were, on average, 10 years younger than the members of the first cohort. So if we developed mind reading by introspection, by merely looking inward at what's going on in our own minds, then this group should have been better than this one because they'd had 10 extra years in which to introspect. Similarly, if, as has been suggested, we learned to mind read like little scientists, we come up with theories about the way that behavior is controlled, theories about the mind, but we come up with them as individuals. The child comes up with a theory by themselves, and then we test theories against the behavior that we see around us. So we merely use other people as a test bed for our own theories. Again, the first cohort had had 10 extra years in which to test their theories relative to the second cohort. So the fact that the first cohort's mind reading was weaker than that of the second cohort, I think is very strong evidence that we acquire mind reading theory of mind through conversation with experts. We are, in effect, instructed on the way the mind works. So, I have presented some evidence that these two cognitive mechanisms, which are very important in enabling us to lead such peculiar lives, are not cognitive instincts, but cognitive gadgets. The evidence that they were in the genes 
um, which contributed to the rise of evolutionary psychology has been shown by more recent observations to be unsound and there has been other phenomena discovered providing positive evidence that these capacities, insofar as they do their jobs well, it's because of cultural evolution and they are assembled from old parts in the course of development through social interaction. And next time, I'll be coming away from the deep sea of uh, empirical science and moving a little further towards the high flight of philosophy, looking at the foundations and the implications of the cognitive gadgets view, the prospects for a different kind of evolutionary psychology, a cultural evolutionary psychology. Thank you.